This week's conversation with David McCaskill is sponsored by CyberPointers. CyberPointers is the only online chapter of the American Needlepoint Guild, and membership is open to all members of the National ANG organization. Meetings are conducted every other month and are run completely online via an email groups program. CyberPointers provides stitching opportunities through meeting programs, ANG correspondence courses, and workshops that may not otherwise be available to our members. Upcoming meeting programs include Tasselmania by Michelle Roberts. Members will learn the basic anatomy of a tassel, start with a simple tassel, and develop the skills needed to create complex tassels. Surprise by Dawn Donnelly is a topsy-turvy cake decorated with fun stitches and bright colors, then topped off with a birthday celebration sign made of scrapbook paper and a burst of wire. Registrations are open for the following workshops, Posies by Margaret Bendig, which is a composition of a variety of stitches used to form a ring of flowers with contrast and texture. Mermaid's Tale by Debbie Rowley, which features levels of water painted on a canvas defined with several small stitches using painter's threads. Various overdyed threads and sparkling sequins are used to enhance this design. Persian Chair by Anne Marie Anderson Mays of Beautiful Stitches is a miniature chair worked with a variety of stitches with overdyed threads. Finishing of the chair is included in this workshop. Be sure to check out the CyberPointers website at cyberpointers.org for all current and future offerings. And now on to our conversation with David McCaskill. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, David McCaskill. David, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Two men, one woman. We win. Yay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Enjoy it while you can. That, well, once you sign me up, I'm forever. I'm just a silent yes. If it comes from Gary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, uh, yeah, all right, this is, this is, is a, a second, I think a second, Mike Parr was the other male we've done, I think, too, so. Um, Who was the other one? Mike Parr, he does uh, embroidery, gold work, that kind of thing, he's amazing, yeah. yeah. Yep, all right, now, uh, one of the first things in, in the studying of you was that you, you started, or one of your early pieces was candle wicking. And boy, that brought back some memories. Uh, I remember well, remember my first candle wicking kit. It never got finished. It was like, uh, I'm not doing this. <laughs> did you ever finish yours? Yeah, I did. I actually had no intention of doing it, but it was getting close to Christmas, and I wanted something from my younger daughter. I was walking by this shop, and there was this candle wicking pillow in her window, ruffled edges. It was perfect for Jean's bedroom. And I went in to buy it, and they handed me this kit. Oh, oh you wanted it, you just wanted the pillow. I didn't want the pillow. <laughs> and they they told me that it, I could do this, just read the instructions. And so I did it. I took it back. I said, now what do I do to make it look like that? And then they finished it, and I gave it to her for Christmas, and that was the end of it. But I found it very, yeah, I just wanted it done. But I found it very relaxing. It's amazing how you could pick up a needle and a thread and start stitching away at the end of an hour. You've already solved world problems. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that your first first needlework venture? Yeah. And then right after that, I did three flower images all in long and short Hmm. well you dove into the deep end in a hurry here yeah then i moved oh then i i never did it after that until i moved up to northern california and that was an interesting thing because when was it 87 no 86 i had midlife crisis and instead of getting a sports car and a blonde, I quit my job, 
took a job that managed a motel in Palm Springs. Just gave me my room and five hundred dollars, which put me into poverty level. <laughs> and I didn't realize I'd done anything really bad until my car got towed away. <laughs> yeah, it sounds funny now. It was very traumatic. Yeah. Well, sure. yeah, that would be terrible. That would be, but but a midlife crisis like that, deciding to just up and change careers. Wow. It's actually the best thing I ever did. I was doing party plan. I started originally with Princess House Crystal when I moved back from Germany and then Jules by Park Lane in Chicago hired me as a division manager and then it, which is great and I had a lot of people but my check was dependent on how many people went to work hmm. and you'd be amazed at how many people don't work <laughs> they want the money but they don't want to put in the effort uh -huh. right. and it got to be so stressful wondering what they turned in that week and how much was I going to get paid I got to a point where there had to be something better than this and that's when I found the ad looking for a manager in Palm Springs. And I was a little chubby then. And after about six weeks in Palm Springs, I was tanned. I was very buffed. And I went out and I bought a uh, Speedo. <laughs> you really I thought did I have a midlife great. crisis here. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. And then Don, who owned the motel, bought a warehouse up in uh, Monterey and he wanted to convert it into a bed and breakfast so he asked if we would move up there and supervise the conversion and the process of knocking down a stone wall I ruptured the disc of my neck and they were pinching on my nerves to my right arm and I literally looked like a stroke person picking my arm up and have it flop at a table. Mm. And so they I had to go to therapy. And the therapy taped a pink plastic needle to my thumb that was threaded with yarn and told me to go up and down in this wooden pallet. It looked like a piece of canvas. And when I told her it was boring, she told me to take up needlepoint. <laughs> so that's what I did. So that's how you got started. Therapy from and a nurse said take up needlepoint. Wow. Yeah. I mean it's like crazy. Just you know, I I tell people now when something bad happens in your life, because not be able to use my right arm for two and a half years was very depressing. Yeah. So but did you, something good came out of it. Yeah. So, so you recovered use of the arm too? Yeah. Uh -huh. It took, it took a while till I got the feelings back and two of my fingers, but I'm pretty much back. I was, thought about having surgery, but I got a second opinion and I didn't like what he said. So I found a third doctor and he said the same thing as the second doctor, which is do nothing, let my body naturally heal it, hmm. which it did. So. Anyway, I find it fascinating that this all happened because I never knew I could. I was I don't think of myself as an artist, even with what I do. Yeah. People tell me I am. And then I look at canvases like Melissa Shirley. Right. She's amazing. And I could no more paint a canvas like hers than a man in the moon. <laughs> but I got a hold of her canvas and I did a, a stitch guide for it. And what I do with threads is magical. Uh -huh. I just pat, in case you didn't realize, I just pat myself on my back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that came through loud and clear. We got that. Yeah. <laughs> so well now done. I actually tell, I tell people I'm a uh, fiber artist. Uh huh. So, but that became my forte. I just, I just don't do fancy painting. I like negative spaces. I also like projects that 
have a purpose other than a wall hanging or a pillow, mm-hmm. which you probably devise that by those pictures I sent you. Right. Pretty much all of them are 3D items. Right. But they they all had a purpose and they all have a place in my house. Matter of fact, in class once, one of the students asked me if I ever designed something just for me. And I go, duh, you're looking at it. If it doesn't go in my house, I don't design it. <laughs> I mean, basically, everything I've done there, I don't know I mean, how many designs I've got, but everything I've done has a purpose in my house, uh-huh. no matter the season. How did you How did you get from therapy to needlepoint to designing? Was it uh, Did you have a mentor or... Did you just no. dig in and learn basket weave yeah. and go from there? How did how did you make that? I mean, that's quite a ways to go. Well, it is. After I, she told me to do needlepoint. I looked at the phone book, and there was a store, not far from where I lived. So I went to the store, and between my house and the store, I thought, well. I think I'll, if I got to do this every day for five hours, I might as well make chair seat covers. So I got there and I, I said, I'm going to make chair seat covers. And this woman showed me these painted canvases and I was on workman's comp and I, <laughs> with a repossessed car in my background. And I looked at the prices and I go, holy, holy baloney. <laughs> And I asked her if there's anything cheaper. (laughs) (laughs) We kept walking around the store, showing me things that were cheaper. And she showed me kits that were cheaper. And jokingly said, listen, the only thing I got to store cheaper is this blank piece of canvas. Uh So I said, well, well, give me a piece of that that'll fit my chair. And she wanted to know how big my chair is. And I said, well, it's bigger than my butt. I know that. So we got a piece of canvas. I went home with a pencil and up in Santa Rosa were vineyards and they have a lot of Jersey cows, the black and white jerseys. Right. And at the end of each row of grapes is a red rose bush. And I'm not quite sure why they do that, but I wound up drawing a Victorian scroll work and climbing roses on it and lattice and black background went back and asked her what do i do now and they showed me silk and the do you have any cheaper came up again (laughs) (laughs) this is your mantra your your mantra do you have anything cheaper (laughs) well i still use that i went and bought a a new refrigerator or computer and i said do you have anything cheaper (laughs) (laughs) so anyway they sold me, we wound up doing pattern A, and, and it was on 13 count or 14 count. And they neglected to tell me you don't stitch with the whole thing. Mm. So I took it back and said, there's something wrong with this. She said, well, you don't, first of all, you don't stitch in a circle. No. Oh. And, and second of all, you got to separate the strands. And the old pattern A, which a lot of people still have in their stash, is a three-strand fiber. And if you look at them, there's a skinny one, a fat one, and a medium one. And doing it on 18 or 13 count, I had to do two strands. So to make sure they were equal in height, I came up with, well, I didn't come up with it. Somebody had to tell me. When you're using pattern A, the baby, which is a little one, stays home with the daddy, and you put those two together, and the mama, which is the, the middle one, goes shopping with her friend, and you put those two together, <laughs> okay. and, then, and then they stitch equally. No okay. high loft. So anyway, she said, you got to do basket wave. And so I had a guild meeting that afternoon, and... I asked one of the ladies that showed me how to do basket weave, and she did. I had no idea what she's talking about. 
Out of frustration, she called Marie over. Marie tried. I still didn't know what she's talking about. And they kept saying, go down the poles, up the steps. I didn't know what that meant. And then when they, I, they said, you always start in the top right corner. And I looked, held that canvas up to them. I have no corners. My roses were rounded petals. My lattice was on the diagonal. There was not a corner anywhere. And I said, well, I don't have any corner. Where do I start? And she said, at number one. I said, but where's number one? Anyway, <laughs> by the, after the fifth lady, I still did not understand. And that I went that afternoon after the guild meeting, we went to the movies and saw a backdraft. You probably remember it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a fireman story. Yep. Well, that bell went off. Those firemen jumped out of bed. They slipped down that pole, came back from the fire, climbed the steps, and all of a sudden people were cheering the heroics. And I'm sitting there saying, oh, my God, they're doing basket weave. <laughs> Down the poles and up the steps, uh -huh. down the poles and up the steps. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that's when I first started talking about basket weave because a lot of people never pointed out to people what the pole was right. or where the step was. They just said, start at one. Well, you've got to have a starting point. Yeah. So, and I, every class, I mean, I've been teaching over 30 years, every class. Some of us, I'll ask some lady, will you, do you do basket weave? She goes, yes. I go, how do you do it? She raises her hand and she wings her finger and go, you go up and down. And I said, well, how do you know when to go up and when you go down? She said, well, I don't know. I just sit down and go up and down. But she had nobody that ever showed her. And she's uh -huh. been stitching for 50 years. Mm -hmm. So... That's one of the things I'm really big on is teaching people how to read their canvas. Because once you read it, it makes stitches easier. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah so, there's a lot, a lot of assumption that goes on that people yeah. have all the background information and uh, you can't assume that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I got that six weeks later. I had that chair done. And... I had a firm belief that after six weeks, I was never going to do another chair seat cover, <laughs> ever. Cured him right there. <laughs> that is. So when I went up to the shop and showed him what I did, Laverne says, oh, if you paint that, we could sell it in the store. Uh -oh. And the word sell automatically triggers my brain to dollars. Mm-hmm. So I went to the, I went to a furniture store first and brought my needle point in and found the chair it had fit on. So that's in my office now. Still have and that people though, sit, okay. Oh, people sit on it all the time and it's just, looks brand new still. Anyway, from there I went to an art supply store and I said, what do I need to buy to paint this? And in the back of his head, he said, sucker, here we go. You need this table, first of all, oh, and no. this chair. So I came home with a full studio. Oh, and I painted the canvas, and they gave me, I don't even remember how much it was. And I got all excited. And then one of them said, well, if you paint other things, we could do a trunk show for you. So I went home, and I started drawing these things, images. One I did that was the cutest was the Noah's Ark. But there was a little ark on the side and the ducks were holding the rope and there were two skunks in the little, little ark. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought that was the cutest thing. <laughs> it's been around all these years. So I, I did like 15 canvases and I did a trunk show, and one of the ladies on the anchor desk, and I think it was Channel 5 or Channel 7 News, she came to the trunk show, and she bought, she was the one that bought my very first canvas. Oh. And you would have thought that I had 
I didn't want to have it. I just could. They were giving me money, and this was fun. So I kept doing basket weave, and then someone suggested I do stitch guides, and I had no idea what that was. But around that same time, the anchor lady went to a class in Petaluma, I think. Oh, I don't know, somewhere closer to the Golden Gate Bridge. And Susan Porter was teaching the class. Oh. And, and so she, I got a phone call from this woman named Susan Porter and said, I'd want to see you in my shop first thing tomorrow morning. And I go, well, where are you? She goes, Huntington Beach. And I said, you know, that is 450 miles from here. <laughs> And she said, you can get, you can be here. I need to see you tomorrow. So I threw everything in the car, took off, and I got to San Luis Obispo. And the timing belt broke in my car. Oh, no. <laughs> so I had to rent a car. And the time I got there it was like four in the morning. And then the only place I could find a room was a Motel 6. And to this day... That's the most embarrassing part of my life. So I had to stay at old Motel 6 for two <laughs> hours. I'm sure they thought I, thought I was a hooker or something. <laughs> so I went over to Susan's shop. She, she looked, I probably then I had 30 items. And she started looking at them, then she threw them down on the floor. And I was so upset about that. This is my property. And she threw it on the floor. So I reached down to put them back together again. She goes, I want one of each and two of this one. Oh. And I'll do a, and I'll do a stitch guide for it, which she did and took it to the trade show. And then somebody asked her, well, who is this designer? And some people were very welcoming. Other people were very nasty. Mm-hmm. So, because my work is very cartoonish, uh -huh. you know, there's not a lot of art. But 35 years later, people are still buying it. Yeah. Now that's so, interesting to me that because you drew the roses, and then you do these other things, but you don't really have any art background. It just came out of you. Um. Well, I think it was my eighth grade, maybe. No, it had to be, what's, well, back then it was junior high school. Yeah. I think that went to ninth grade. So in ninth grade, one of my best friends drew a lot. And for a summer activity, he asked me if I'd go down to that art center down in have you ever been to San Diego Zoo? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that little village outside the main gate? Mm hmm When I was in ninth grade, that was all artist galleries. Oh. And in the summertime, each one of them gave lect classes and stuff. So I spent the summer doing a class. And one day we went to the zoo, and we had to draw I think we were instead of the rhino. So I drew the rhino and looked just like something out of a comic book. The woman was so traumatized <laughs> that somebody, she was my teacher, and I did a comic book, Hippo or Rhino, whatever he was. So, but that was basically it. How you knew I was creative. That makes sense? Yeah. You know, even when I was little, I knew I was creative. I would do things like, you don't want to buy that chair, Mom. It's ugly. Uh -huh. You need a chair that looks like that. Um, I would show my grandmother, who was a French immigrant, I would teach her how to cook. And I had no idea how to cook. It just was, it just, things just happened. Yeah, you're as one, I got you're, older. Yeah, you're one of those. It's just in you, and it comes out. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And part of me, too, is I have this strong desire when I hear somebody doing something and it sounds interesting, I 
instantly thought how I could do it and make money. And it literally in my whole life, that's what I've done. I accomplished things like I was in, lived in Europe and I was in the army still. And this lady in the office who was a secretary, her husband was a agit, oh, oh, I don't remember his title, in the uh, American embassy. And she had to do a, a dinner party. And she says, you know, I don't mind cleaning my house. I don't mind setting the table because I have people to do that. But I hate cooking. And I said to her, well, I could cook. She says, well, can you do a dinner party next Saturday? I go, sure. <laughs> and, she, and she says, well, let me see your, your menu. And I, like I had a menu in my back pocket, right? <laughs> So I went home and I took some regular typing paper and went through cookbooks and wrote down titles of stuff. And then I burned the edges and then I had some gold foil paper and I glued them onto that and put them into a little leather binder and took it to her. Here is what I do. <laughs> and, and you'd never cooked she, any of that. No, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately she selected Craig Suzette for dessert and I cannot even tell you the experience of walking into that house with all these recipes in my back pocket on three by five card and looking at the Craig Suzette on how to get it a flame I go oh my god and I did it huh. and everybody raved about it and then one she was from the Brazilian embassy and she booked me to do a luncheon oh my of champagne fish and champagne sauce now I, I had to find a recipe to do that so I did that and one thing led to another and the post the commander of the Frankfurt Germany army unit whatever he was called general something his wife asked me to do a birthday party for her and she gave me a recipe that her mother used to make on a cake and said i want this as our dessert and did that it turned out fine she said to me well i'd like you to do a luncheon on thursday and i said oh i can't do that because that's my day for kp and she looked over at her husband and says, George. And of course, I got out of KP. There we so go. I could cook a bake, bake. So I never did KP after that, ever. Because <laughs> she kept me busy. Jean from the embassy kept me busy. And at one of the dinner parties was the uh, CEO of Pan Am Europe. Uh -huh. And his wife booked me to do a dinner party. And at that dinner party was the CEO of Chase Bank Europe. His wife booked a party. And after eight years, I got a discharge after two. And eight years later, I'm still cooking. <laughs> and I had a staff of 11. Oh, my. And I taught myself how to cook. <laughs> Came back to America. America wasn't interested in the way they entertained in Europe. So that's how I got it from there. I went to Party Plan, which is Chris, a selling crystal uh -huh. because I knew how to set a table. Yeah. And, and then that I went to Hughes Park Lane and from there I went to here. Yeah. And, the, and during all those years, I also was a dog groomer. You'll do anything. I know I, yeah. yeah, I didn't know how to do a groom a dog. And back then, we didn't have computers where you could look it up. Yeah. You know, so my when, first poodle was a little interesting. Yeah, I was I was going to say I bet I bet the poodle was was an interesting to see. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was the first dog was the poodle. Of course, yeah. And, she, and of course, she wanted the puffs on its feet. And, so she got more like cotton balls on her feet instead of the puff balls. <laughs> It'll grow out. They'll be okay. <laughs>
When when did you start the store? The needlework uh, store. Let's see. Uh, 1994. Uh-huh. But it was a different store. It was a different kind of store. Because the shop that I went to originally, they were closing. And they wanted me to buy it. But when you buy a shop, you buy the good and the bad. Right. And I didn't want to deal with any of that. So I told them no. And then I was on the car one day. And um, you probably remember the fires not long ago. Fountain Crest mm -hmm. burned down up as that the big red barn. Blah, blah. Well, they were building the that whole area was just starting. And they were putting in a country club for a golf club. And if you'd like to be a founding member, call this number. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And I came at home and I told Stephen, I said, I think I'm going to open up a store because we don't have money over the store. You got $87 or $870 of the checking account. What are you going to do it with? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. So I thought about it and I thought, well, nowhere in this country is there a country club for stitchers. So I thought, well, first thing I'm going to do is go see if I can find a place. And I found an old chiropractor office that had been unrented for three years, right across the parking lot from the Flamingo Hotel, which was built by the mafia. Mm -hmm. And each room had an inside door and an outside door. Just in so case. <laughs> pri so privacy could be maintained. <laughs> so I thought, well, this would be perfect. So I really called the owner. He came over and I said, okay, I'll take this place. But I need you to take this wall down, that wall down, put a window over here, recarpet this stuff. And I'm not going to be able to pay you first and last, but I'll pay you first when I move in. And then I'll pay you last 90 days after that. Mm -hmm. so, so I had a store. He was going to do all the interior work. All I had to do is pay the first month's rent, which my $875 would have covered half of it. <laughs> and I go, well, I'm in good, I'm in good shape. All I got now is, until he gets the store, I got a month to come up with the rest of the money. So I went over to the hotel to have lunch, and I went by the, the office, and I told the lady I was going to open up a store across the street, a country club for stitchers. Could I refer them to the hotel and let them get a discount? And she's, oh, yeah, we'll give you a corporate discount. And I go, hot damn. And there was a clothing store a little ways, and I went in and said the same thing to her. Then I went to a shoe store, and then I went home and typed up this wonderful letter. I went back to the shop that was closing, and my $875 bought their mailing list. Oh. So in essence, oh, in essence, I had nothing but my workers' comp check. So, well, I had more money than that because I was painting, but... I was in a different account. I couldn't touch it. Uh -huh. Anyway, I typed up this letter. Basically, it says, you don't know me. Some of you might. But I'm going to open up a country club for stitchers adjacent to the Flamingo Hotel. The country club will give members discounts in the store, discounts at the hotel, discount at Alvarez, which is a dress shop. It was very popular. And in the shoe store. And all you got to do is send me $110 and you'll be one of the founding members. Now, I hadn't signed a lease yet. I ordered no product yet. I, I had written nothing to anybody. I mailed them out. And that night, Channel 7 News did an expose on mail fraud. Oh, oh boy. I know. It's just like, oh, my God. But 55 people sent me $110. Okay, that works. So, but, yeah, that worked. I got the first month for the shop. 
That was the only money I had to have. Telephone company made me do a deposit. I still had money. And then that week was the trade show. I was, I had a, a booth, but I took breaks periodically and went around and ordered materials. And I said the same thing. I'm opening a country store, a country club store. And I, I want to carry your line of threads in my shop, but I don't want to pay you for 120 days. And since people knew me, they trusted me. Uh-huh. I mean, Rainbow Gallery stuff came in on a pallet. <laughs> wow. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how many. I think I had 114 lines, and they were all wow. full pallet. Wow. And it was impressive. You were you were really stre- you were really stretched out there though financially. Wow. Yeah, but I never, I never. Anytime I've got in a situation like that, I've always figured out how to get by. Uh huh. I don't know what, why, or how, or just happens it just happens yeah so so the, so, so up, i'm a member of i'm a member of this store and then how does that work after that well the back two rooms where i had the walls moved i turned into a an english country english living room with a velvet sofa chintz chairs a little dining area with a Victorian dinner chair table mm-hmm. and floor stands at every seat. And the only ones that could go back there and stitch from club members. Mm-hmm. And I had a kitchen put in and I hired an English couple to come to you. Uh, there's two ladies that would do come in and do high teas for me on Saturdays. So, started selling membership. They reopened, and I thought I was going to have a lot of interest. So, two girls I hired to work there. I gave, taught them how to give tours. Oh, welcome to Club Stitch. This is our campus area, oh, and this is our classroom. We have glass wall and doors so that the class can be quiet. This is our thread room. And this is our Christmas room, and this is our club room. When you walk the corner, it's pretty impressive. This is all done with red and green and white chintzes. It was very pretty. And then I told the girls, it's going to be very busy, so be prepared. And this was like quarter to 10. And I looked out the window, and there was absolutely nobody in the parking lot. <laughs> Not a soul. I go, oh, crap. <laughs> so I'm in the back of the store in the Christmas room, and I had on my Christmas tree, I had a lot of Savorsky crystal ornaments. Uh-huh. So, so I hung them from the ceiling because there's a lot of them were star shapes. And I rolled up the window and I said, Oh, God, if there is, if I meant to have this shop, you better give me a signal real quick. And just as I put the blind up, the sun came over the mountain behind me, and my whole shop lit up with rainbows. And I figured, well, that was my clue. Uh-huh. So I went up and we tore the vapor down. You couldn't see the parking lot because the people standing in front of the windows. Uh-huh. And, and at the end of that day, I had signed up 120 people to be club members. Wow. So every time they came in, I had their number. I mean, their the card number and I'd ring it into the register. They automatically got a 10% discount mm-hmm. on whatever they bought. And then if I did a trunk show, if the artist was close enough to get to Santa Rosa, I would bring her in and I would have a cocktail party for her. And if they couldn't come, I would still have the cocktail party. And the people that were the 110 members all got to come to the cocktail party. Uh-huh. And then their husbands could go play golf. Out of town people could stay at the hotel. And so at the end of the 
when I finally sold the store, I had 687 members. Hmm. That sent me $110 every October 1st. Uh-huh. And here, and the people in the trade show, when I first ordered materials, they were outwardly laughing at me. One of, one of the, the designers, uh, one of the, yeah, designer, she hauled in two shop owners and said, tell them what you're doing. And says, this is good. You're going to find this so funny because it's not going to work. People are not going to pay you that money. And I said, well, I don't know. So I told us two stores and they laughed and left. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to get the last laugh on this. Uh-huh. And once people realized how successful, I started getting bus tours coming in, literally bus tours. Mm. And I arranged with the hotel to have luncheon served over there. I mean, it was just uh-huh. pretty amazing. How long did this did uh, how long did you have the store? Uh, I had it four years. Oh, so you had a decent run there, yeah. Yeah, I would have lasted longer if I wouldn't have had a heart attack. Oh, but I was seven days a week, ten, twelve hours a day. Yeah, I bet. running a store, you can't just own a store and open the door and expect it to happen. Right. You have really got to work the store. So he said something had to be. Something had to go, so I sold the store, and the lady who bought it, a year and a half after she bought it, she closed it. Oh, so all right, so you have the heart attack, and then uh, wh- what's your next step there? Is that uh, to go back to painting canvases? And Yeah, I revived my wholesale line, and then Stephen got transferred from uh Sacramento he was to Chula Vista to open up the new veterans home and he was personnel director I, I missed out who is who is Steven I missed out on that he's my husband oh okay so he's so he got a job all right yeah we've been together almost 36 years oh, so wow. It's been a long time. Yeah. I, every day I tell him he's happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we, we went to San Diego. I redid my wholesale line. And I still have it. But then I had quadruple bypass. Oh, man which put stress on me because these people, the shops wanted it for their store. And it's amazing how people don't take into consideration the issues you have. Yeah. Right. For example, when I had my first heart attack, I was teaching a class. But that morning, a lady called and said, I need to come by because I need help with a stitch. And I go, well, I've got a class till 3.30, so come at 3.30. Well, the ambulance hauled me out at 11.30. <laughs> she shows up at 3.30. The girls say he's had to go to the hospital. He had a heart attack. She goes, well, I wish he would have called me. I could have come sooner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well. And when they told me that, I go, well, she must have been joking, obviously. And then I develop a clot in my right leg where they did the where they put the stent in. Yeah. And he said, you have to stay on your back for six weeks with your leg elevated. So I went back to the shop. I laid it on the couch, brought my leg up, and told Mary, who was working that one, to call everybody, have them come in. I needed to do some kind of a meeting how I'm going to handle this six weeks. Right. And just then this lady comes in. She, she wants back to the classroom and says, there I am laying. She's Oh, good, you're here. And I go, well, I can't do any. Look at my leg. It's twice the size of my other leg. She goes, what is that? I said, well, I have a clot. She goes, well, this is only going to take a minute. Oh, <laughs> so I went home and I told Stephen, I think the shop you might be killing You can't make this me. stuff up. Come on. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just like, it's just funny. So I told him we had to, I had to sell a store. And then shortly after that, he got this 
transfer to San Diego. Uh-huh. And, well, I was down there. Needlehook, La Jolla, wasn't far from where we lived. And so I went in. I used to teach for Bernice before all, I, I even had the store. And so she was happy to make me her resident teacher. Oh. So I so I taught every Thursday in her shop. And when you have repeat clientele over and over and over again, I ceased to be the teacher. Uh-huh. I became the entertainer. <laughs> I think people I come for lunch and me making them laugh. So, so I'm able to do that too. It's just very easy for me. But I got to say, stitchers, probably all craft people, are the kindest, most gentlest, and fun-loving people I've ever met. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really hard to find a pickle, but every once in a while you get a pickle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, when did I know you taught um, for A and G, a online class? Your um, the, when they did, when they first started, I took your background, background stitches. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that kind of overwhelmed A&G. Carol Lake did the first one. And I'm not sure how many she had, but it wasn't a big whoop. To get, that it wasn't handable. And then I did the second one, which was a background sampler. And it was over 500 people. And it was like, whoa. And then 500 people, there was 130 of them that didn't understand. They couldn't make copies of everybody's instructions. Mm. So they never paid me. Oh. And, oh. I, and I called the president, and she says, I told her what's happened. I got 130 people that haven't paid me, and the class starts Monday. And I know for a fact... They've traded, copied the instructions. Because the instructions showed them how to draw the boxes and everything. Right. So they didn't, they didn't really need me. Uh, the people that don't like to draw boxes, they ordered them from me. Some ordered a blank canvas, and everybody ordered the instructions. So right. she said to me, she said, well, we're just going to have to let this go. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I said, you might have the money to do that, but I don't. <laughs> so I sent out a message. You probably got it. But I was going to take a legal action if I did not get the people's payments. And I found out that they're in the class. Right. Well, all of a sudden, I got all but seven, I think. Well, it, and that was seven, interesting. right up. That was an interesting class because it was done by groups at that time. I, some sort of email listing. So we got all your instructions via private email, didn't we? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I typed each instruction. Right. It wasn't a bit a visual thing like Zoom is now. Right. But each lesson was, I think there were what, eight lessons? Oh, I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember either. I, yeah. I, I have mine finished. I did actually, I ended up doing two of them. I did one for myself and one for my mother. And because I enjoyed it so much. And I still refer to those background stitches because it was such a, a great class. Because every now and then that's what you need. You need some way to fill in the background of something. And well, that's what, once I realized how popular, it was the most popular thing I've ever done. I sold over 3,000 of them. Mm. And so that motivated me to do number two, which are larger stitches. And I'm in the process of doing number three that covers, the, you know, canvases of paint with a border around it. Yeah. So it's going to cover borders. And then it's going to be a, six lace patterns. You're very open and lacy. And then I think the series will be finished. Hmm. And I'm working on a book. I've been working on a book forever called A Stitch Primer, which is going to be everything I do, everything I know, 
in some of my stitches, which are kind of I make up stitches. So if I look at a canvas and it's a tree, I try to make up stitches that would look like a tree and the thread that would look like a tree. Mm -hmm. People ask me all the time, how do I decide what thread to use? And I go, well, look out your window. You're doing a tree. Do something that looks like bark. Mm -hmm. If you're doing leaves, do something that looks like leaves. The one thing that bothers me is skies. Everybody loves doing diagonal stitches on skies. And if you look outside, nothing, the sky does not streak diagonally ever, which is probably not true because I went to a party in 1963 when I left the next morning. That sky definitely was streaking <laughs> on, the, on the diagonal. <laughs> But, but that hasn't happened. That hasn't happened since. I was yeah, going to say, yeah, yeah that's, that's your one off there. <laughs> yeah. How, how I felt the next couple of days, I'm not ever doing that again. <laughs> so, so these day, these days you're, you're painting canvases, doing uh, stitch guides, teaching. Uh, what, uh, what of those things get your heart beating faster than the other? Or is it all you just enjoy doing all of it? Uh, I enjoy doing all of it. Okay. But I don't do all of it anymore. No. Because I'm 77 years old. And I tend to work every day, all day. And when we moved up here, Stephen retired. And so I wanted to get to a point where I had more control of my time. So I switched from re wholesale to strictly retail. Mm -hmm. And I had set up my own website. I stopped selling wholesale because I didn't want the shops to think that they were selling my product and I was selling it too. Yeah. yeah. So I'm pretty much a little shop in the country. Out. One of my neighbors has donkeys and camels and sheep and buffalo in his front yard. So it's a very rural area, but it's not. It's just not very developed yet. Uh -huh. So now I just I just do orders. If somebody orders something, I do orders. Um, a month and a half ago, I stopped taking canvases for Stitch Guide, but added a just a stitch on my website. So, like, if you had a, you're sitting in the area, you just don't know what to do with the sky, you buy a stitch, and then I send you the stitch diagram and oh. a suggested thread. So, and that's working out pretty good, and it's cheaper than people paying for stitch guides. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the designers, they do a stitch guide once, and then they keep it, and if somebody else wants to, they sell that stitch guide to another person for the same price, which to me, that just doesn't seem right. Mm. So, so I never, I don't ever resell a stitch guide. I start from scratch and it's always different. And I have a few stitches that I like, but basket weave is not one of them. Yeah, yeah. I fig figured that was not on the list, yeah. <laughs> no. But I heard Susan Porter one time say that every canvas should have an area of basket weave so your eye has a place to rest, mm -hmm. which is true. If you look at some of the finished canvases on, let's say, Needlepoint Nation, they have so many stitches and textures going on, you completely lose the image. Mm-hmm. So um, that's when, my advice. That, yeah, go ahead. When, I'm sorry. When you do a stitch guide, what, you know, if, like, if I had a painted canvas, uh, do you have some basic steps that you take initially that at least get you going in terms of, of setting up a stitch guide? I mean, do you, how do you evaluate the, the image so that you can at least get started? Um, I start from the background, come forward. Okay. 
is if you're doing trying to create depth on a canvas, you want the smaller stitches towards the back, and some of the stitches overlap. So, and then I just look at it. I just look at it, and I said, okay, the sky. Let's start with the sky. Let's give us, I'll do this stitch. And I look online to the color cards, and I'll use this, this thread. And then this tree is sitting there above the houses, so, but I don't want it to overtake the houses. So on my computer, since I have a graph, I've got every stitch I ever chart is saved. And I probably have close to 4,000 stitches on my computer. Mm. And none of them were identical. They're all different. So now I just go through them like a book. I just and I look at scan them. Do I see one that looks right? So then I cut and paste into the stitch guide. Some take longer than others. So and so you just build it up that way. So then, so you, as you're doing this, you I mean, obviously you don't stitch the thing. So you're you're able to visualize at least roughly how you think it how it will look, and yeah. uh, you you can just I you see have, that. Okay. Many years ago, I had a friend in New York who was a uh, wrote music for theater, and I asked. I was back there. He had a dinner party that he played, and I asked him how he comes up with these songs. And he says, well, I hear them in my head mm. before I sit down and I write a note. And I thought, oh, I do that. I see stitches in my head before I stitch it. So I don't know how to explain that. I, yeah. I think everybody who's got a talent sees it in the head before they do it. Yeah. I mean, uh, even a doctor, I asked my I asked my doctor once, and he said, well, like you're going to have this. Blah, blah, blah. I had a aneurysm and I, that was getting ready to burst. And I said, well, how can you make sure that I'm not going to die? He said, well, in my head, I know how to do this surgery. All I got to do is in your how inside your gut. I said, OK, that, I, that I makes sense to me. <laughs> so same with cooking. I'll look at my refrigerator, which is a bizarre example. All I have is a jar of olives. So I pull that out and I go, well, let me see what I can add with this. Then I look at the pantry. Then I look at the vegetable crisper and pretty soon I have a meal and I started with olives. Uh -huh. And Stephen has two things he says to me. Well, that was a really good dinner. I don't think you should do that again. <laughs> nice try but i'll pass <laughs> yeah yeah some of them I've actually written down i i did a cookbook not long ago well yeah long ago the older you get the further time doesn't seem very far yeah but it was back in late 1990s and it was called, what do you mean you want dinner? Can't you see I'm stitching? <laughs> yeah. And some of my students, when they saw I was doing it, they sent me recipes. And I put that in the book. And it did pretty well. Yeah. Uh, now, these days, do you, uh, you stitch quite a bit just for pleasure? No. No? Okay. No, right now I'm stitching on background sampler three. Mm -hmm, so. I don't know. I, you know like I don't go to seminars because to me that's like a busman's holiday. <laughs> okay. I would go for the social camaraderie. Mm -hmm. But then when they're in classes, what would I do? Mm -hmm. In fact, Maureen, who does the editor of Needle Pointers magazine, said, well, I'm not taking classes. Come class and you can just sit in the lobby and stitch. And I go, yeah, but I don't, I want to talk to people. <laughs> so I didn't go. Uh -huh. Are you able to do, uh, do you have time to do pleasure stitching or is it all to further the cause? 
Well, I don't know how to answer that. Oh, okay, that's all right. I, I stitched a pillow, and while I was stitching it, I had a class here at my house, and one of the ladies asked if she could order order it. <laughs> and I go, well, of course, you got the money. I'll paint it. <laughs> so it's still not finished. I got wrote the stitch guide, picked out the threads, made up a painted a canvas and sent her to her. Uh -huh. I don't know. Just like I think I sent you the picture of my bottles. Yeah. Perfume bottles. Mm hmm That if you look at that, it's a color wheel. Mm hmm And whereas the blast glass bottles overlap becomes the different colors. Yeah. And that was supposed to be my color wheel in my office because one of those paper round color wheels didn't look good hanging on my wall. No. <laughs> right. And and somebody saw that and wanted one and off and running. That's been another really good seller. Mm -hmm. uh, during the pandemic, that pandemic, Zoom completely changed the industry. Literally. I mean, people can sell stuff. They can do classes. Shortly after that, we had the shutdown or during. I did a Zoom tour of my house. Not that my house is that great, but I have needlepoint everywhere, including the toilets. Mm. And I just walked around the room and showed them how I display all this stuff. And it all was very tasteful. I'm not cluttered. They go where they belong, and then I never change them. Uh -huh. And that was pretty fun. I had 300 people in the first tour. Yeah. And it was Zoom. It was just amazing. Then I started doing classes, and then I I do um, Facebook now for people who are doing just a stitch, one stitch. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll call them on Facebook to discuss. That I don't think this stitch is going to the stitch you've got next to it is not going to work. I.e., they did the background and diagonal mosaic with an over dye thread. Do you do other techniques? Well, I started with um, embroidery uh -huh. through an EGA gel. And when I first, I saw an ad for a show, and this is before I even took up needlepoint. I, and it was a show that the guild was doing and I walked in and it was like, holy mother, this is nothing like my grandmother used to do. <laughs> and I went to, when I got to laugh, I asked, the name was Tula, if men did this. She said, oh yeah, we have a lot of men. Well, you know how that turned out. <laughs> so I go to my first meeting, no men. Right. My second meeting, no men. Third meeting, no men. And... When we went to lunch, I made a comment that I didn't think I was going to be coming back because I, whatever, I just wasn't, there was no men there. And sometime in my first meeting, all the women on one side of the room, and I was by myself. <laughs> like, why is this man in our domain? Well, she got back and started talking to somebody, and an hour after lunch, I was nominated and voted to be the new president. Whoa, wait, wait. Whoa. <laughs> I know. See, you can't, you can't turn your back on them. I'm uh, telling you. Yeah, I mean, how am I going to quit? I'm now the president. And that sounded so impressive until I realized it was the president's job to get people to make cookies, among <laughs> other things. Oh, jeez. And, and getting volunteers is very difficult. Right. So, yeah. so I figured that out. I said, okay, who wants to come and help set up tables next month? Okay, we'll bring a chair to sit on because nobody's doing it. What about cookies? Anybody bake cookies? Okay, we're not having cookies. Um, is going to anybody help clean up? Nope. Okay, we're not having a meeting at all. There we go. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, well, we really have to. I'll do it. So, I, And then my very first class with Needlepoint, was a piece by Sandy Rogers, uh, Silk and Metal. And 
they we got our kits, started stitching, and everybody kept saying, oh, you need to use a lane tool. And I got, I got one. See this little finger? It's working just fine. <laughs> so as the class progressed, I realized my silk looked terrible. And then I found out we had to turn it into Sandy for a critique. I go, oh, God, I'm president. And she's going to say something terrible, terrible. So she'll so spring in on Wednesday, and I was ironing my shirt. I noticed the iron had a setting for silk. So I laid it down on my ironing board. I covered it with a nap, uh, Kleenex, napkin, whatever. Put it on silk, waited till it heated up, and I ironed that sucker. And I turned it over. My silk was so beautiful. As a matter of fact, Sandy Rogers commented to how well I laid my silk. No. <laughs> and to this, I never met her. Unfortunately, she's passed away. And I always wanted to run into her so I could tell her that I had another option. So I thought this was going to work on everything. So the next thing I pieced, I tried to iron it, and I'd used flare. Oops. And pretty much the oh. flare kind of melted. And yeah. The canvas... <laughs> canvas crooked up and I go, oh no oh. so I, I don't ever do that again but <laughs> yeah i'll bet that was a mess <laughs> yeah. oh that's funny but i got a good rating from her and shortly after that they, they ega had their um regional seminar at mills college have you ever heard of mills no that one i no. don't know okay it's up in San Jose, not San Jose, Oakland area. And it's the woman's college. Well, here comes this lone man with 600 women. <laughs> and all the women got put in this modern wing of the college. I got sent down. I think if I walked 10 more miles, I would have been in Mexico. <laughs> it was bound by myself in a whole building by myself the last room at the end of the hall. And the only thing in there was a bed and a chair. <laughs> and the lady who got me to go was region president. She said, well, come down to ours tonight. Because I was complaining. I'm all by myself. There's nobody to talk to. So I walked in the door. And this woman in a very loud, hysterical voice started screaming, man, man, man. And I go, oh, these women are jerk going everywhere as if I had never seen a woman in a bathrobe before. <laughs> so I stopped going down there, too. So, <laughs> But my very first canvas that I ever did took blue ribbon. Uh -huh. And it's like... You know, this is the first time I ever made something myself that got a ribbon. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with the county fair. It got a blue ribbon. And it's like, oh, the best things that ever happened in my whole life. Yeah. Yeah. So, That's and great. unfortunately, they were hard to do because they were, I did them to match my chair seat with mm -hmm. the black and the white uh -huh. and the red. On forty count linen, mm. which it's hard to see those holes. They are small, yes. Yeah, they are small. Yep. Well, David, this is this has been uh, this has been a blast. Thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. Uh, I have fun talking about needlepoint. Yeah. Oh, this is great. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all that, and thanks to everyone for listening. Yeah.